How deep is your love? Hello everyone, it's me, just got a coffee and socked feet, I should explain, uh, i got new trainers, um, I parted, I know, some of you are going to be shocked, I bought feeler trainers, don't know what to say, but I bought feeler trainers, if you hear something that sounds like a clementine being unpeeled in the background, it's the least subtle clementine peeler I know, <laughs> that's him laughing now, Nathan Sparling, little gorgeous man dimple fest that he is you could get a whole segment of Clementine on one of those dimples you know that <laughs> yeah there he's laughing so I put these new trainers on and um, I thought oh, I can't be bothered to uh, turn the laces because I'm 52 I shouldn't I should have somebody to do that for me that's a joke so I just I sort of tucked the laces in under my feet and I just felt like I was going to fall over that's how old I've got now I can't be cool do you know why Nathan Sparling Dear listener, beloved listener, do you know why uh, there was that look for trainers without laces in? Do you, know what that, do, you, do you really not know what that's about? You're so street and hip, youngster. I've got jeans older than Nathan. Um, it was because that's what happened when you were in uh, were held in prison. They take the laces out of your trainers. Yeah, same reason my jeans fall down around your backside. It's because they took the belt off. You stop behind you yourself. That's a lovely upbeat start. To this week's podcast. We're going to start with a joke. Ready, Nathan? I am. Right, do you want to sound a bit more committed? Oh, <laughs> you fucking... Knock, knock. Who's there? Right, okay, calm it down now, okay? <laughs> just fucking, just, do you know what I mean? Find the middle ground. Karl Marx wrote about this. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Find your synthesis, brother. Knock, knock. Who's there? Oh, done in such a catty way. I like that. Sorry. Knock, knock. Who's there? Okay, I'm not sure what the fuck that was. <laughs> she was trying to be professional. <laughs> I've never seen a man bolt through two Clementines so quickly. Um, and I mean quickly. <laughs> and I mean bolt. Uh, knock, knock. Who's there? Hardeep. Hardeep who? Hardeep is your love. Hey. Welcome hey, to the second uh, of our food-based uh, podcasts, uh, which are uh, podcasts about two things. They're about food and they're about love. Because what is food? Love. What is love? Food. We love? Food. We food? No, love. love. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. Why did you suggest we do that? It doesn't work. It's always all about him. Uh, this week, we are going to be across all our different channels talking about, I would say, my favourite of all meats, pork belly. Is it your? It's not your favourite, is it, Nathan? Not my favourite, but I think it's the most underrated. See? That's why he's here. That and his dimples, lovely cute <laughs> dimples. Um, it is massively underrated and, uh, and underutilised. All I have to say in its defence, it's been it's coming to its own a wee bit more in the last 10, 15 years. I think as chefs have been looking for cheaper cuts to be more experimental with. And to, oh, now, I should have warned you, that's the buzzer. Right, I'm going to tell you, just bear with me. Bear, don't stop recording. Don't stop recording. This is live. This is what they want, Nathan. <laughs> this is what they want. Hello, hello who's that? It's Heather. Come in, Heather. We're not stopped recording. Come in. Don't say anything rude, though. So, right, that was the buzzer. That's Heather. Heather's one of my best friends. Right. Oh, fuck, fuck. <laughs> Hello, Heather. Is it working now? The clink of right. so, sparkling water. Right, so I thought I'd I've got to explain to the listener what's going on here, right? Sorry, dear listener. So, it's summer in Glasgow. <laughs> it's been unseasonably warm. And I have taken to drinking sparkling water. Because I'm off the television. I don't know if you're aware of my... I think many people will call it superstardom. No. So, I, I enjoy sparkling water. Yeah, the one lovely thing about being home is you can drink water straight out of the tap. Not like in London. But I do love a sparkling water. It comes from the Campsie Fells. The one I drink. Which is surprising, because when I first went out of London, about 30 odd years ago, everyone there was drinking sparkling water, bottled water, because the water was shite in London. Um, it's not bad now, but it's not great. Uh, and everyone said, oh, would you like a glass of Highland Spring? And I'm like, no. 
because I walked the campsy fells. I know where we pissed. So no way. Forgive me. I just had to share that with you. So uh, you kind of get sparkled water anywhere. Sparkled water. That's that'd be a new thing we do. You can't get sparkled water anywhere in the East End of Glasgow. I mean, Morrison's don't have any. I mean, literally bare shelves. With obviously with Brexit, it's no great surprise. Um, Co-op don't have it. You can get it from the wee like Italian deli, but it's like one pound fifty a bottle. I'm not paying that for glass. I don't need glass in my life. We be some plastic more easily. So that was Heather who's brought up. How many bottles of water did you bring, Heather? Four. Just four. Are they glass? No. Okay. Oh, I heard glass clinking. Yeah, that's the wine. That's the wine. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my family. So, we're talking about pork belly. And it is. Nathan's absolutely on the money. It's the most underrated of all the meats, I think. Now, I should explain... Uh, where we are with pork. So I'm I'm of Sikh extraction. Um, I grew up in a Sikh house. So the the banned meats in our house would be but technically beef, although there is some disputation over that, if I'm honest with you. Hindus definitely don't eat beef, right? Uh, now, here's the thing that's interesting. The world's media has made us fear the Muslims, but it's the Hindus we should be scared of. Shall I tell you why? Don't tell anyone. Don't you think it's a bit suspicious that their holy animal is a cow? <laughs> really? If I was going to create a holy animal, it'd be like a giraffe or a duck-built platypus or that thing. You know that thing they named the trainers after in the in Serengeti? Gazelle, a gazelle. They're amazing. See how high they jump, how elegant they are. Anyway, um, the Muslims don't eat pork. But also, there's a part of me that loves pork because I like... I like the renegade. I like the underdog. I like the outsider. If two of the world's major religions, Judaism and Islam, have banned the cons- consummation, the consummation, the consumption, or indeed the consummation, that could be why they've banned it, because of the consummation. But if they've banned the consumption of a meat, I want to have that meat in my diet. I love pork. I love a sausage. I tell you, right, listen, Charlie Hodson, he does amazing cheese and sausages. Brilliant, brilliant chef of sausages. And actually, the recipe we we're doing today is um, links me and Charlie Hodson, one of my dearest friends. Brilliant chef, fantastic human being. Uh, he's a great cheese shop in uh, in Norfolk, and I'm down with him at Christmas cooking uh, at his cheese shop. He, um, anyway, I'll tell you the recipe. It's pork vindaloo. Does that interest you, Nathan? Ooh. Nathan doesn't always know what the recipes are going to be, do you, Nathan? No, no, no. no but I always know how cute his dimples are going to be, so one of us is at a disadvantage. So, I I grew up eating pork at home, but not very often, you know. Uh, like To this day, my mum won't let me take beef into the house, right? And that's fair enough. That's her belief, and I, but I eat everything. Um, and I also think if you're going to kill an animal, and this is quite a serious point, if, if an animal's going to die, and I realise I've got some vegetarian, vegan listeners... Um, I apologise for this, but I think you might actually, as much as you can applaud anyone eating meat, you might quite like this sentiment. If you're going to kill an animal, eat all of it. Eat every. Eat. I want. If I could eat the oink, I'd eat the oink on a pig. I've had pig's ears. Um, every part of the pig you can imagine. I eat offal. There isn't a bit of offal I won't eat. I've had chitterlings. Do you know what chitterlings are? So chitterlings are basically the lower intestine. It's a bit from the colon up, and it, unsurprisingly. Do you know what chitlins taste of? The shit. They taste of shit. Because that's pretty much what's in them. Actually, I tell you, no, they taste They taste of the uh, <laughs> the substance they use to get rid of the flavour of shit. That's like domestos is what they taste of. Um, I've had squirrel. I have had squirrel. Um, anyway, we're not talking about squirrel. That'll be a much, much later podcast. Um... So, pork belly. So, here's what you need to understand. Um, here's what you need to understand. When I was growing up, there was a kind of... A, okay, it goes actually back to my parents growing up. Uh, India is a country that's held together by the tension between the different factions and religions, yeah? Don't, for a minute, think it's some great big yellow submarine of people loving each other and respecting each other's religions. There is a great deal of that, yes? But still, there is a suspicion that all organised religion brings. And people rub along together and 
India is a country of deep religion and the ability to lose you temporarily quickly and do daft things. So the religions get along despite each other. So what you'll find is in the big cities like Delhi, um, like Bombay, Ahmedabad, um, Mangalore, Bangalore, places like that, um, there is invariably a dominant religion. Hindu, Hinduism is the dominant religion across India. But in different neighbourhoods, it'll be like the Muslim neighbourhood, the Hindu neighbourhood, there's very rarely a Sikh neighbourhood outside of the Punjab. Because there's, there's more Christians in India than Sikhs. Did you know that, Nathan? More Christians than Sikhs. And it's fantastically funny when you see what Indian Christians do with uh, the names of, uh, of Christian folk. So, for example, you'll you have the, the um, uh, Joseph, uh, Jesus, Mary and Joseph uh, sawmill. Because in India, using religious names blesses a place. Not like here. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you know what I mean? You wouldn't have like a Mary Magdalene couches, you know? Or Doubting Thomas betting. We wouldn't want a betting shop there doubting at the front of it, would you? But that's a very specific New Testament joke. So um, you tend not to find pork being available in kind of regular high street places, similarly with beef, just out of respect to the religions. But as I say, in, in the kind of the Muslim ghetto, the heartland, is best. Now, here's the other thing I need to make clear. You're going to hear me talk, I think you heard me talk in the last podcast, about my me, my belief that Punjabi food is the best food in the world. I love Punjabi food, Muslim Punjabi food is the best, right? So, obviously, this is a recipe that will never be cooked by Muslim Punjabis or Muslims anywhere. Vindaloo uh, comes from Goa. It's a, it's a Goan dish. Now, here's the interesting thing about Goa. We are aware that... Uh, India was colonised by the British successfully. The French, to some extent, there's a wee place called Pondicherry. Have you heard of Pondicherry? It's right down the south. So if you imagine, India is actually the shape of an arm bread. I mean, who knew? And Sri Lanka is like the little bit you've broken off. Uh, so just above the bit you've broken off uh, is Pondicherry on the east coast of the tip. And you can still get croissants and croissant shops and all the rest. It's a bit French. I'm not Ben. I couldn't quite get it in my itinerary on the first book. And it was too far away for the second book. But hey, who knows? I might do a third book for you. Actually, should we do a third book for them? French India. Very specific. Four people will buy it. <laughs> so we charge £4,000 each. No, I'm joking. Just to cover the flights and hotels. No. So, uh, the French and the Portuguese. Now, so 1947, India got its independence. Pakistan got its independence in the form of East Pakistan and West Pakistan. East Pakistan in the early 70s, 71, 72, it became Bangladesh. Uh, but it wasn't until 1961 that Goa stopped being Portuguese. Did you know that? Goa. Goa, 61. And basically the Indian army marched in, just took it back, annexed it. Which, when you think about it, it's a little bit like cricket, right? Or football. Portugal has got what? Population of what? 5 million? Right? How can we not find 11 people in a country of 1.3 billion to be better than them at football? But certainly better than army wise. So, but the amazing thing about Goa is this it's something like 50, uh, I can't remember, it's like 45 or 55% Christian. So, because of that, um, there are fewer Muslims there, you know, more Hindus. So, pork is available everywhere. You still get Portuguese butchers, you get beautiful sausages and all kinds of these pork products. And pork is what is bought in the market. And it's fascinating when you've travelled the rest of India to come to this place, especially when you're a pork lover. Um, just the most delicious, delicious uh, food available. Now, what Now, what we will be doing, as I mentioned in the Chickpea podcast, we're going to start breaking down India to regions. The thing about the south is that it's very hot. So you think, oh, what shall I have in a hot climate to cool me down? Do you think ice cream? No. Do you think a spicy curry? Yes, Nathan, top of the class. So the hotter the curry, the more you sweat, the more you sweat. The, 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 and the same is true of tea. Hot tea lowers your body temperature. Now, we have to put some things right here. The Vindaloo Marketing Board has not done well in this country. I'm going to probably give over a special podcast to, um, so I should explain for our uh, kind of platinum members, what we're calling our saffron members, uh, you get a free 
something every three months, and this will probably be the free podcast, one of the free podcasts you get in your first year of uh, of membership. It will be an explanation of British Indian menus, and we'll probably make that available in another form. But this whole notion of oh, Madras korma is meaningless. This kind of uh, hierarchy hierarchy of spices means nothing. There's no such thing. Do you know what they call a chicken madras in Madras, Nathan? Chicken. <laughs> Do you know what they call an Indian summer in India? <laughs> summer. I know. It's self-evident. What's the name is so often in the title. Um, but here's my theory as to why chicken madras and stuff. There needed to be a way to convey to the, the, the eater of this strange new food what it was going to be. And people were, you know, rightly concerned about spice it's not something that naturally occurs in the daily kind of menu and diet in the west although having said that the great thing that surprises me every time folk that have never had haggis before is how spicy it is peppery and coriander you know that's about empire uh, that's another another podcast for another day um dimples has given me that look so um what were we talking about what? Madras, Madras, right, right. So, chicken madras was probably called uh, Handiwala Chicken Aluna, right? Which means big pot chicken with potatoes. And the, the, what was that? What was that, Ali? Ali Baba? <laughs> what, did you, what did you say your curry was called? And the waiter's going to go, where's the chef from madras? Chicken madras, that's what it's called, because that's where the chef's from. You know, the same way that those of you that love The Godfather, you know The Godfather films? Have you ever seen them? Nathan, oh, leave. Get out of my house. So in the uh, so the Corleone wasn't actually the name of the family; it was the name of the town. But it was the only place the immigration officer could spell correctly. So a lot of the curries devise that. Now I think it's fascinating. We will def- I'm definitely do this podcast on the British Indian menu. It's so interesting how these things have happened. Um, but you need to understand that the Vindaloo police allowed in plain sight their curry to be taken and misappropriated right i swear please don't, i mean ugh, i'm i'm gonna swing for the next person that says they're gonna put their toilet papers in the freezer when they have a chicken or a pork vindaloo that's not what vindaloo is about there's no dish that's the other thing i object to about these hot curries right these hot curries are about the heat and not the flavor why would you ever eat food for that reason? You might as well not bother and just eat the chili straight because you can't taste anything else. And I promise this to you, right? The vindaloo will be probably the curry you cook. If you join us for the cook along on Friday, and this one I really want you to come to, okay? Because I, I really want to have an opportunity to smash that misconception, yeah? So when we do the, the, the cook along on Friday, you'll see that... A vindaloo has got lots of chilies in it. But more than that, there's a sweetness, there's an astringency, there's a depth of flavour that I'd argue doesn't exist to that extent in many subcontinental curries. It's right up there. It will it will perplex your palate, is what it will do. You know? It will it will create a maze around your mouth. You you You'll be chasing these different flavours. It's when done properly, it's sublime. It really is. It is there is a heat to it, but the heat is throughout your mouth. It's a cooked in heat. Yeah? It's not I've added some red chilies five minutes before serving it, right? If you ever go to a restaurant and they serve you a vindaloo in less than forty minutes, don't buy it. There's no way you can cook a vindaloo in less than forty minutes. Now, let's break down the word vindaloo, because here's what's interesting. The Portuguese, uh, obviously a big wine-creating culture. So the va, we think, was wine. Dalu could be either, uh, the alu, but could be garlic, or it could be potato. Alu is potato. So wine with potato with garlic, right? Now, obviously a lot of Indians, even though they were Christians, don't drink. So the, the wine became vinegar. Very, you know, they're cousins, but also enemies of each other, whilst also being family. Is that surprising? Have you been to India? Um, so the the nature of the vinegar is really important. Now, I faffed around with Ponzi vinegars, 
You know, I've, I use, I do use a couple of tablespoons of balsamic in my vindaloo, but that for me is because I'm selling that, you know, and I, I'm using a cheap meat. Pork belly is amongst the cheapest you can buy. So I feel for my customers, I want to show them that I'm respecting this meat. So I'll put an expensive ingredient in because I think it just really rounds and gives, again, just increases the orbit of flavor around your mouth. It's oh, I'm so excited about you trying this. Um, because I've held this recipe very close for a long time. I haven't, sh- I haven't shared it with many people. Um, so the, with the Port Vendaloo, it, it's counterintuitive to the North Indian style. What you do is you create, more like the Thai style cooking, where you create a paste before. That's what you do with red onions. It has to be red onions. Vinegar. Choose your vinegar. I, I like to use a, a red vinegar um, uh, because it gives that the, the colour I want. Now, cooking vinegar down, I don't know if you've ever done this, I braise a lot in the winter months with vinegar. So I use vinegar, a chicken or a veal stock. I'm not sure I'd use veal stock. That animal's died. I'm going to make sure it's respected in the stock and the meat form. Uh, and some water. So that I love braising because what you get is you get that, that the astringency remains. But it's, if you imagine the astringency to be like a, a wee ball of dough. As you cook it, you just flatten that ball of dough. It's still there. It's just wide. It's just wide across your mouth. It's like one of those, it's like a Barolo, just where the tannins feel like they're outside your face. They're so, oh, deliciously soft, comforting, cosseting on a cold, cold night where you're alone. No mobile signal in the country. Anyway, that's another show. So we'll create the paste. Um, I, I, I love a lot of, uh, I love a lot of garlic in my, my vindaloo. Um, you blitz this and use pork belly. Now, the reason for pork belly is quite evident. A lot of people, um, and my dear friend Heather, who brought the um, sparkling water in, she doesn't like pork belly because she doesn't like fat on food. Now, my argument is that fat should render down. It should give you flavour, but also you need that fat to work against the vinegar and the spice. You need it. Yeah? So... um, and again, what you do with this is you don't brown your you're not you're not browning your meat like like you do Punjabi style. So with a Punjabi curry, you make a dryish masala, slightly wet, but like you're not liquid masala, and you fry your meat off. Right, sealing meat in a curry is a nonsense. There's no point. I mean, there's so many other things going on, you know. But what you're doing is just cooking off the outside of it, and then you add your liquid. Here, you add your pork belly into the to, to the broth, if you will. So it actually boils. Um, and that's great, and it's so unbelievably tasty. And as you reduce that vinegar down with tomatoes, tomato puree, sugar. Sugar is hugely important in this. Weirdly, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, I could make, I could lose any one ingredient, including the pork belly, in a vindaloo, and make it, but I can't lose sugar. You need the sugar. The sugar in this dish is much like sugar in Chinese cooking. You know, you kind of think, ooh, sugar. But it actually, it joins the dots. It's everything else are the dots. And the sugar is the pencil that joins them. Yeah? I'm um, quite happy with that analogy. I'm just going to sit back and enjoy that analogy for a minute. What uh, What do you think What do you think the dot-to-dot image is going to be, Nathan? What do you think? It should be a car? A little man on a car? Yeah? Noddy? Do you know why uh, elephants have got big ears? Because Noddy wouldn't pay the ransom. Okay? <laughs> Fuck off. Like, this is great day stuff. If you had had a great day at work today, you could give me that look, son. But we both know what you did with that pasta earlier on. Anyway, let's move on from that. Um, so you cook that down. And and again, when vinegar cooks down, it's very similar to what happens when wine cooks down. All those fruit flavours. Think about where vinegar comes from. But also, I tell you, I use Ponce vinegar. So I've used like a, a, red, char, uh, like a red wine vinegar. I've used Chardonnay vinegar. I've used a bit of balsamic. I always use a bit of balsamic for colour as much as anything else. And also, I've always got a bottle kicking about. Although, interestingly, I've just spent a few days down with one of my oldest friends, Steph, uh, down in uh, Hampshire. And Steph does this. So you need to know, Steph and I... So Steph in, and I started from very modest background, which is why we're the best of friends. But like we move in different circles now. So she has always got half an eye on the overheard things in Waitrose. So she wants, actually, for, for truth, heard a couple saying, wait us, darling, do we need balsamic for both the houses? <laughs> um, <laughs> I know, love it. 
So I always have balsamic kicking about because I do this, particularly with the kind of the, the, you know, the soft white bland cheeses, the burratas, the mozzarellas. I just think there's something about dressing them with a bit of really peppery vinegar and really sweet balsamic, just delicious. But if you, the great thing about this dish is if you've got chip shop vinegar, it still works. They're not using posh vinegar in the shacks in, in Goa. This dish will surprise you. I would go as far as to say almost more than any dish I know. Um, it has got chilli in it. It's got lovely red chillies in it. It's got chilli powder in it. Of course it does. You know, lots of black pepper in it. Delicious. We're doing a whole episode of the podcast actually next week, I think, about black pepper. Um, or the week after. Um, it works really well with pork. It works really well with chicken, so long as it's not breast. I'm, I'm not. I, mean, I can't be. I can't be doing with breast of chicken. It tastes of nothing. It's not that bit in the Matrix and it goes, "How do you know what chicken tastes like?" Because you've had breast all your fucking life. That's why you don't know what it tastes of. Um, weirdly, I did a tuna vindaloo, monkfish vindaloo. You know the big flesh, firm fish, cod vindaloo. You know, but you have to be very careful with the cod vindaloo because cod isn't as robust as monkfish, I don't think. Um, beef is good with this. Venison vindaloo. Now, um, venison and raspberry vindaloo. Just genius. I used raspberry vinegar on that as well. There's something, about, you know, that, that the sharpness of raspberries against the sweetness of venison. You know, it wasn't hung too long, so it wasn't too gamey. It was still sweet. Um... So yes, and that's what we're going to do. Uh, so come for the cook along on Friday. Um, find your slot. Sign yourselves up. We'll be talking about other pork belly things this week, but spare ribs. Oh, I didn't tell you about my mum and spare ribs, did I? So I grew up on the Great Western Road in Glasgow. First flat my family owned was on uh, 605 Great Western Road, right in the kind of the cool bit. We didn't know at the time. It was shit when we lived there because we lived there. Um, but there was Scotland's first KFC, and my mum, my poor mum, bringing up three boys, her guilty pleasure, right, once in a while, and I brought this up with her the other night, she wasn't keen to discuss it, because it's a bit dirty, would be for KFC, right? So, uh, in those days, it was a proper KFC, it was the only one in Scotland, I think, and it was like they cooked everything properly on the premises, but they did spare ribs. My mum loves a spare rib. I love a spare rib. Take me to any of the mili- myriad brilliant Chinese restaurants in Glasgow and I say this to you dear listener if you want to come visit my hometown and you love Chinese food I think you're in the best place UK if not Europe for Chinese food we have a massive and vibrant and delicious young Chinese student population here and they love their food and they've gifted us oh I mean listen don't get me wrong I'm not fond of immigrants (laughs) no joking um the best Chinese food great spare ribs uh so we're doing a spare rib recipe uh in the in the week a chinese one but also an american one i really love what they do in the southern states uh of america and um then we'll do my overnight um pork belly which will be in the around the world in 80 plates book which is a book of uh, the, the food i do that isn't from india i mean that's probably my favorite sunday lunch pear pears uh, so it's overnight so it's a 14 hour cooked pork belly with thyme pears and a pear cider gravy pears pear cider reminder of a whole Stuart Lee routine there if you don't know who Stuart Lee is go and watch him he's possibly the funniest man on the planet she, 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 is that good do you like that I'm quite happy with that I'm really hungry now I've got some pork belly um listen tune in TikTok Instagram Facebook Twitter and Patreon um and remember I say this pretty much every week this isn't a monologue this isn't a soliloquy this is a conversation. I mean, we are here doing this because we want to know what you think and what you feel. If you want a, a, a book about anything or if you want a subject included in the book, the great thing about writing a book chapter by chapter and dropping it to you every month is it enables me to react to what you want, yeah? So just let us know what you want. Um, Have a look at the different packages on Patreon. Um, And I look forward to speaking to you soon. But let me leave you with this thought. Do you know why two of the great world religions have banned the eating of pork? Do you know why? Because pig's the only animal in the world that can that can devour an entire human body, including teeth, but not a Rolex. And it was that fact 
they caught an East End of Essex gang out in 1983. I made that last bit up, but the first bit's absolutely true. Hardeep is, was, and will forever be your love.